Um, I've been glad that I was able like, to grow in a company that had a feedback culture. Um, it has a very weird name. It's called Sulke, and I'm sorry, we cannot, call, we cannot change that because it's, a, it's the owner's uh, or the founder's name. So it's a, it's a Swiss company, and we just recently relocated um, some of our people to Singapore to open the, start, uh, open, uh, the location, and it was one of them. Uh, that's why I'm here. Um, I do have a technical background, so I work as a lead software architect, but also work with teams together to train them um, in how could they use, for instance, Scrum to be, or become a better engineer, to have a better output, um, or also to use like clean code and architecture to actually build better, better products. And besides of that, I also realized that not only technology makes us what we are and what we do, I also realized that obviously we have a lot of skills that are not related to JavaScript or to Angular or to TDD. We also have skills or we need skills that we need to interact with other people. Because after all, we, what we do is we, we write software, not or we write code not for the computer, not for the compiler, we actually write code for people to understand it. So we have to understand how, how people work. And this is nothing new. Uh, we know that already almost 100 years. So there were studies in one, uh, 100 years ago that actually told that um, majority um, of, of skills are actually soft skills that make a career for someone. And this is just a recent study about soft skills that say, well, soft skills are almost as important as hard skills. The good thing is, over here, we already know how to deal with hard skills. Um, or if we don't know, we at least have some feedback that it doesn't work. So, but we, we have some tests, for instance. We, we, maybe we have some test suite that we can run. We have acceptance tests. We have specifications. So that's all okay. Uh, we, can, we have solved that. But unfortunately, and what people also call like the, the, the gap that we still have after 100 years, um, is we don't really know how can we test social skills. Well, we, we can just behave in a certain way and hope that people don't run away. Um, maybe that's not the best, the, more, the most efficient way to do that, because if people are not here anymore, well, we need new people. It's not very efficient. It's also not very human. Uh, so we need other things. We, we need something else. We need something um, that continuously tells us how we do, that also um, gives it that, that feedback in a way that we can actually accept, and that we can um, build on that. So it should be motivational. Unfortunately, and that's also what studies say, um, and it's also part of my experience, is that people actually want to have feedback. They often seek for feedback, or have a desire at least for feedback, but at the end, they don't get the feedback because they are afraid of what they're going to hear. And the main reason is they are afraid that it might affect their ego. <clears throat> So to get around that, we have to establish around something. So we have to establish something that people feel safe. We have to establish something around that people are used to do so, that they don't feel bad if they get positive or even negative feedback. And what we are missing here is a feedback culture or an environment um, where it leads to more often, to more frequent uh, fee uh, feedback gathering. And wh wh what we can do, or what I also did, um, digging into a topic that we need some additional know-how, we can reach out to research. And actually, research did um, find some aspects of uh, feedback environments. And luckily, um, they match plus minus to my experiences, too. Um, there are a lot of aspects, and I would only cover four today. Because I think these four are the most important ones. And we go through one by one. Um, I give you some inputs what you can do to actually improve that aspect in your company or in your environment, in your team over time. The first of them is source credibility. It seems obvious. So if we want to have a feedback, we need to have someone that we trust. And I hope for all of us that we are in an environment that we trust other people or at least that we have some people that we can trust. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard, and otherwise, um, we, we will not be able to solve that issue here. Um, but there are a lot of um, good, um, good ideas how to establish trust. So I'm not going to talk about that today. 
The other thing, also pretty obvious, um, the person that we reach out for feedback has to be qualified. So it at least has to know more than we do. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. And it should be able, or that person should be able to evaluate. Um, maybe should observe how do we behave, should be uh, able to, to judge. And it has to judge against something. So there has to be some um, kind of specification what we, what we want to what we want to have at the end, what, what kind of behavior that we, that we are looking for. And I'll give you an example why this is so important. These eight numbers, they have something in common. Please raise your hand if you see it. Okay, pretty fast, huh? Three seconds, number four is in common for all of them. Let's do another example. What do they have in common? Okay, it takes, takes much, much longer, yeah? So the problem over here, number six is missing. But it's really, really hard to detect absence. What we can detect is our things that are here. But our brain is not wired in a way that we can actually see what is missing. And that's why we need some help. We need some help from colleagues, maybe from company, maybe we even have an HR departure that have thought about this. And they have came up with some things that bring some light into, the, into that darkness. And these things could be like company values. So when we evaluate someone, we, we probably have to evaluate against something. That could be company values. If we don't have that, maybe we have even a company culture document that tells us wh what do we expect from people, how they, how they should behave. If you don't have that, maybe we have to develop that. Maybe we can start with job descriptions. We also have some technical stuff and probably also have some behavioral stuff that we put into our job descriptions to realize or to, to attract people how we want to work. Maybe even worse, if you don't have that, maybe go to job roles and try to figure out oh, what do people usually do with that role. Um, Carrier paths are somehow connected with that. Maybe we can even see from carrier paths what we expect from people uh, when they want to progress. Second thing. If I reach out to you with that email, what could be a possible answer? One thing could happen, nothing. Because, well, I was not really clear what kind of feedback that I expect. Well, it could be an opinion, could be like the title, the size of the title, like maybe the summary. We don't know. We don't even know if it's the structure. Or the other thing that could also potentially happen is this one. I just get a lot of feedback for things that I have never asked for typos, grammar, whatever, colors. Um, so it seems to be important that before I ask for feedback, I also have to kind of specify uh, what conditions that I want to be evaluated. Or in a more detail, what, what conditions of my article um, should be present in a way uh, so that it's interesting for a reader, whatever that reader is. And this seems to be obvious in software, because we know that, that kind of statement, we have seen that already. So it's nothing new. It's actually the perfect definition of an acceptance criteria. I just changed a couple of words. We have conditions of a feature that, it has to be, that have to be satisfied in order to be accepted by someone. So, Together with the request that we send out, we also have to specify what exactly that we want to have um, as, as a feedback. The, the more precise we formulate that, the more precise we get an answer. So great answers actually start with great questions. Um, like if we, if we translate that in, into how we behave, we could, for instance, add, what, what, are the, the, what is the top ability or out of my abilities, what is the top ability that you like? Or if I have to improve one certain thing, 
through my work together in that team? What would that be? Or how could I improve to make your life better? One thing. So now we know um, against what that we want to evaluate. And we also know how do we make sure that we get most of that evaluation. But we have still not yet covered how do we deliver that to a person, especially if it's not only positive. If we have to deliver negative feedback, and that's also something no one likes. Or do you want to raise hands for those that want to like, provide some negative feedback right now? Yeah, see, no one wants to give negative feedback. But we still have to do it. So I would like to focus a bit on, on negative feedback uh, delivery on here. And we can start with a, with a little example. And let's see how you feel about that. Your colleague asks you, can I give you a short feedback? What happens? You run, run away. Your mind tells you, oh, no, 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 I don't want to hear that. No, 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 I, I, I go. Because we are like programmed in that way. Let's think that colleague was in a communication seminar, had some, like, some training, and he heard about the sandwich technique. So he starts quite differently. He says, well, I really like you as a colleague. But you already hear the bot that follows here, so you run even faster. So we don't want to be there. So we want to be somewhere else. <clears throat> Luckily, that's quite easy in Singapore, but other story. Now, why does that happen? Our brain, as I mentioned, is, is, is very old. It's, it, it's, it's stupid old. And it, it doesn't really change. Or the, the internal structure of our brain doesn't really change and adapt to to the two days requirements. These are sometimes also called the biases or like just the circuits that are still there from the older ages. And we all know that pyramid, and that pyramid actually helps us to explain that reaction. Because our, our brain is trained to self-serve us. It's like the kind of self-serving bias. So whenever we hear something that we think is wrong, we uh, perceive that as a threat. So someone wants to do bad things at us. He does not tell us the truth. He has, he has to be wrong. And because it's such, such a primal threat, our brain actually tells us, oh, well, this has nothing to do with self-actualization or self-esteem. This is really fundamental. This is so fundamental that it affects our safety. And when something happens to our safety, like crossing a road and the cab driver is arriving um, at the same lane and we see, oh well, we hear honking and we, we have to move away. So we get some adrenaline and we move, uh, remove the blood from our, from our brain and to be able to like, move faster. And what happens then, we don't clear, uh, we have a, don't have any clear thinking methods anymore. So we just follow the patterns and we either fight or we run away. Same happens here. We either fight and are not able to listen anymore to the real facts, or we run away and just ignore. And that's actually also the reason why sandwich technique doesn't really work quite well. Because if you start with something, pos sorry, start with something positive and then like slice something beefy in here, something weird, then that will stick. There will nothing else, nothing else will be there. So in order to make it more acceptable for, for, a pe for, for a person to receive negative feedback, we, we can start thinking about ourselves first. Do, do we have the right motivation to, to do that? Um, what is our relationship? Are we actually able to give some neg negative feedback? Do we, have, like, do we want to, to coach someone? Do we want to help someone? That should be the first thing that we have to answer. If we can answer that with yes, then we can continue. And to make it an experience, a, a joint experience for, for the one that 
gets the feedback, we can start with a question. Um, a question in a sense to integrate the other person into that conversation by just asking, okay, what do you feel about your, per um, what do you feel about your performance today? Um, what, make, what made it good today for you? So we give the driving seat to that other person. And that person will immediately feel much more comfortable than the other way around. And for sure, we have to inject some positivity here. Um, depending on the answer of that person, we probably have to, can underline. Uh, because again, that person won't say something negative about him or herself. So we just start with some positive also, like underline. And then we probably have to um, tell what do we want to achieve now. That's why I liked a recent um, a slide that I have seen here in that room, make the implicit explicit and tell what do we want to achieve together. I want to make sure that we have higher quality in our software. So we have to write more tests as a team. That includes you. Or we want to start with the daily at 9 sharp or 9.30 sharp. And I don't want to lose time uh, by waiting for everyone that arrives. In general, try to focus on what is actually visible. What, what, is, um, what, what did that person do? What was the behavior? And not about the person. Don't ever tell it you're a lazy person, that's why you're late. That, that won't work, obviously. So try to focus on what you can see and put it into your opinion. Uh, well, in, in German, we used to say, well, I see, um, I think, which is a perfect thing to start. Just like uh, make sure that it's your own observation. So when you receive a feedback, that's absolutely easy. It's just a gift. You can just receive it and say, well, don't destroy it. Say, thank you. That's what we do when we receive a gift. Just say thank you. It's usually enough for that time when you receive a feedback. Although usually it's, it's appreciated if you follow up. Whatever is in that package, either right or wrong, it's an opinion. Um, you need probably some distance to see that. Um, but it's an opinion of another person. So don't um, let it to, through to your, to your person. It's an observation of another person. It's usually easier to just say, as I said, thank you. And I will come back to that later. Um, because we are, sometimes we are really bad to act on the spot and just like give immediate feedback. So we better let it sink and maybe follow up the other day. It's a very powerful tool, actually, to follow up later. Maybe you have to schedule another one to one to clarify some, some thoughts. Or maybe, and that is, that is really appreciated usually by, by the feedback giver, um, give him some, or her some plan, give him some, her some ideas what you want to do next. So just to validate, does that go in the right direction? And the similarities, again, to, to frameworks, um, HR frameworks where we have like a lot of feedback loops, which is for me is essential. Um, so by clarifying, we introduce another feedback loop to make sure that we go into the right direction. What for me is the most powerful thing about receiving feedback is within that message, that message, that gift, there is a motivation between the lines. There is a transport of values between the lines of the feedback giver. So what we can learn is there, what are the values? What are the beliefs of that other person? And how much does it align to my own values? It also triggers a thinking process about your own values. Maybe you are not at the same page. Maybe you have to shift your values. Or maybe even the other person is not at your page. And maybe the other person would be happy to learn what's the difference about values. And we talk a, lot about, talk a lot about values and culture in general today. So this is a perfect example how you can make sure that your values um, 
are in sync. But use these values, for instance, in a culture document or in a company uh, value um, description, does it really match to what we, to how we behave, to what we live? So we now know to what can we relate if we need to provide any feedback. We now, how, now know how we can articulate that feedback that it's most useful, that it is not harmful at the same time. Um, but that doesn't really help us that much if we don't have the opportunity to give feedback or to reach out for feedback. So as, 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 as um, engineers or even as, as lead, team leads, we have to make sure that we have the opportunities. And that's what we have to do as a leader. We either have to lead by example. One example could be, I just provide you a feedback service. Everyone knows that. So whenever you want to have a feedback, you reach out to me, whatever it is. Maybe I just delegate it to someone else that has the experience to do that, that can cover that technology or behavior or whatsoever. Or just start asking for feedback. It all starts with, with the leads. If a leader starts asking for feedback, the followers will most certainly also try to do that. Um, and also invite for feedback sessions. And we see later a very, very great example how we can create feedback sessions and drive that as a leader. And then we have somehow to, to structure it, to integrate that. Um, we do that. Uh, two times a year, um, not necessarily connected with appraisals, um, but usually connected with uh, mid of the year, um, and also connected to project timeline. So when, when a project ends, we try to reach out to our colleagues and collect some feedback. Or if we leave a project, or if we achieve the major release. So these are also um, situations where you can reach out for feedback. And by designing a feedback process, um, it makes it easier to, for the people to, to be in a safe environment because they're just um, encouraged to do that at this certain time, or point in time. Where you can also do that is in interviews. I've not seen that many companies like providing instant feedback in an interview, but that's also something you can do. You can start doing, or ask for feedback during the interview situation. We use a tool, it's called 360 Feedback. It's called 360 uh, Feedback because it reaches out into all dimensions. Um, in our company, we include superiors. We also include um, colleagues. Uh, we also um, include direct reports. And we also include customers. Um, obviously, because we are a service company, we also include the customers into our feedback. So every engineer reaches out to these groups two times a year to collect three different feedback results, which is quite a thing. And someone has them to read that through. So it's a good baseline to actually plan the future of that, of that employee. We have a couple of roles, actually four of them. The objective is always to empower the employee. We want to develop the employee. It's not about getting more salary or moving to a different country. It's about seeing the strengths and actually develop them. We have to make sure, or the feedback seeker has to make sure that the source of the feedback um, has adequate uh, credibility and quality. Um, we can do that by just providing a form, for instance, for the quality. To make sure that we ask the same questions over and over again from different people. Um, we make sure that we um, have a consistent way of doing that. And it's in written form, so that we can just ex exchange it. Um, but it's this cost together in a one-to-one. -one. Um, because that seems to be easier, because there are no misunderstandings. And there are no anonymous feedbacks. So in an in a area of trust, there shouldn't be any anonymous feedbacks at all. One example that I really like about what, what can we do as a leader um, to encourage people 
being able to give and receive feedback is uh, our fish bowls. We do that quite often, actually, to grill our management. So we just put management in the center over here, uh, leave some uh, seeds left, and then start discussing. Usually we have a moderator that like, initially starts with the discussion, um, like put some fire um, into, into that inner, inner circle. And then like, develop, um, management starts to discuss about certain topics like, um, I don't know, employee benefits. And then whenever someone from the audience wants to also be included in that discussion, has to raise the hand and then move into the inner circle. So then the discussion, the participants change over time. And whenever someone from the inner circle doesn't want to participate in the discussion anymore, just leaves the circle. And that also applies for management. So we had like a couple of situations where someone less initially was in the circle and then moved out and was just like observing the discussion and wanted to say something and actually already started and was just calmed down by the audience that he's not his, at the right place to speak. So this really has to be enforced. Um, but obviously then that person can just move in back to the discussion. So this is very transparent. Um, um, our sister company in, in Germany um, does that with, with more than 300 people. So they just have one room and one big stage and everyone is allowed to join and add his two or three cents. So in terms of feedback, what we should not do, or like in, in um, situations where we should not provide any feedback, um, I think there are two that are important for me. Uh, one is when we just do that by the end of the year, because it's a, it's a bias. We are have then a biased view because we only see the most recent uh, things that happened, either positive or negative. And the other thing is we should not collect it with any salary um, expectations. Because if people have to reach out for feedback or if people reach out to feedback, they just start to optimize that. Um, so they are, don't have any motivation anymore like to get negative or improvement feedback. That sounds complex. And there is a good thing about that whole topic. There are shortcuts. And shortcuts in a sense that if you don't yet have a place where you have a feedback culture, probably you want to have a shortcut. And you can actually detect companies that have a great feedback culture and know it's not sticky notes, although it's a good indicator for a tech company, um, but it's not sticky notes. It's about interviewing. So whenever you attend an interview with, with a company, make sure or watch, look out for these four points. How do they design the interview? Do you talk to experts that actually know what they do? Like, can you have like an expert talk about the topic that you are passionate about? Um, do, do, do they ensure like a quality during that interview? Um, process. Do they have some guidelines? Do they have like some questions that they ask for every every candidate? How do they deliver feedback? How do they communicate with you during that session? Um, we usually ask also candidates about their experience during the interview, and that gives some insightful feedback also for us to design an interview process. Um, it's important to see that because usually if companies act like this, they're investors into talent. They want to develop people that join their company. And they also want to make sure that they um, hire people that match into their current feedback culture. But this is just a shortcut, right? So we should start with ourselves. We should start getting used to feedback. And what you can do what I really like is the thing called personal retro. It's a personal retrospective that you do after one day. And you ask yourself, just on a scale, how was my, for instance, team contribution today? And then there is one, one very important step. Don't ask, what can I improve? Try to step away from yourself. Try to get the outside view and ask about what can Michael, that guy, guy over there, what can Michael do to improve? 
to reach a 10. This would just be notes. You get used to analyze yourself. You get used to what could you improve. You get some insights about how you behave just by asking these two questions. And to prevent you from any biases, you should include your colleagues into that journey. So reach out to them, reach out to them and ask them, do they agree? Do they disagree? Do they have additional thoughts to share with you? Once you have that, your colleagues have probably realized that you do some great thing. You should take that time then to discuss together how do you want to scale. Make your colleagues own that feedback environment, that process. Ask about yourself in a team, what, on what do we want to have a feedback? How do we want to do that? And when do we want to do that? And put that into a structure that we then can call feedback culture. Besides all that, don't forget to also praise your colleagues when they do something meaningful, something outside of the box, or something that's just fantastic, especially in front of their managers. Talking about feedback was a pleasure for me, and I would also like to hear your feedback by just scanning that code and putting some thoughts into that answer sheet. Thank you very much.